Good afternoon. This is Joshua Walker at Japan Society. Obviously, I'm not actually at Japan Society, but still locked at home. But I'm excited to be joining you for a tea time with Sakura Yagi today. Sakura Yagi is, is synonymous uh, with Japanese food because her father and her family's brand, uh, TIC Restaurants, is known as basically creating Little Tokyo in New York. They're one of our favorite uh, folks that we get to talk to. And Sakura, I'm really excited to talk to you today. How are you doing in this lockdown right now? Yeah, thanks Joshua san for having me on and I'm really excited to be on this show and thank you so much for um, always frequenting our restaurants. Um, it's been very hard for us, uh, just honestly, we've closed all of our restaurants um, just to protect our staff and we currently only have one place open, Korea, um, just to do hospital donations um, for healthcare workers. So that's been keeping me busy these days. So the last time we were talking, you were literally taking curry from your restaurant to the frontline workers, you know, and I feel as someone who grew up in Japan, curry is about as close to comfort food as you can get. Uh, where did you come up with this idea and like, how did you start implementing that? You know, curry is, you know, comfort food, like you said, and a lot of non-Japanese uh, households uh, or people who didn't grow up in Japan, they wouldn't know maybe that Japanese curry is you know, a quintessential Japanese food. You know, it's what our moms or dads made for us um, and we would eat, especially with like maybe a side of a katsu to just kind of amp us up. And it's just, yeah, like I said, quintessential comfort food. And so we decided on Japanese curry and just kind of started out small. Um, I just reached out to friends um, who are healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, just friends from school, friends from life, all walks of life, and um, reached out to them to see if they wanted food. And that was kind of the only thing that I felt like I have had control over, um, just to do something. What could I do um, to that, that could protect my staff, that could uh, let me do it on my own, um, so that only I was bearing the risk and um and that I, I thought I could do I'm not a chef I'm not someone in the kitchen I'm usually at my desk writing emails and doing office work but um curry was the one thing that I knew that I could do I mean, it's amazing. We talked to Dr. Yanagisawa in a previous episode and kind of he was talking about what it's like to be in the epicenter of Mount Sinai. And it really is bringing out the best in a lot of New Yorkers. Um, and, and I just, you know, obviously want to commend you for what you're doing. But also, what's it been like as you're going into these places? You're assuming a lot of personal risk. You've got a young child as well. Like, how are you kind of mitigating and thinking through this? Also, since so much of this is just the uncertainty, we don't know when it's going to end. Um, how do you think through what you're actually doing? And does that help you get through the day knowing that that's what you're doing daily? I think that we are creatures of uh, patterns and rituals that we do day to day. Um, and, you know, COVID-19 just really threw that out the window you try to take back control of what you can. And that's why for me, I wanted to make sure that I would bear the risk alone. And you know, I, I uh, made the decision um, on March 28th to say goodbye to my daughter. I thought in the beginning it was gonna be for about two weeks. Um, to say goodbye to her, leave her with my parents and stay behind to do all these hospital drops. Um, yeah, I think my daughter would have been okay if it was just me and her, but if I'm running around outside the house, I don't have anyone to look after her. And so, you know, I, I asked my parents to look after her and I'm just worried about infecting my parents. And I think a lot of younger folk like um, maybe us, we worry about not necessarily our own health, but the health of the people around us and our older uh, community members, our parents. And so to protect them, I said goodbye to my daughter and I've been alone in my apartment. Um, and it's, it's really, really, it was a really hard decision. I probably cried for a few days, um, but it was necessary in order to protect the people that I love the most. Um, and to do something that I could have an impact that I could do, you know, that I could 
actually tangibly help people and um you know have a purpose during this entire yeah thing. i mean i think I, as a father of two little ones i can't imagine that decision but it's just also it, it's the right decision because you know you and i may not uh even know that we're carrying COVID, and yet we could infect those that we love most and it could lead to that and i think that's what's been so hard about this you know what makes new york new york is all the amazing restaurants and the arts and culture but they've all ground to a halt because COVID 19 has literally robbed us of the ability to be with one another uh, i guess one of the things we're also seeing is just how important the restaurant business is to our economy i mean over 10% of the jobs in this country are run by the restaurant world. You started by saying you wanted to do what was right uh, for your employees and putting people first. How, how you know, you're, you're the COO of this major restaurant business. Um, how are you thinking about as you come back? I mean, right now you're in crisis mode, you're helping others, but you've also got to be worried about what that future looks like and what your restaurants are going to find in the new New York that we all come back to. I think it's, it's been very, um, not necessarily eye-opening, but I think things change day to day. So when we first closed all of our restaurants to protect our staff um, from this, you know, silent enemy, um, you know, we were thinking about the the health of our staff first and foremost. Um, and just because we don't know, it goes back to this uncertainty: who has it, who doesn't have it, who's a silent carrier, and to kind of uh, in lieu of this elusive test that we, you know, hear of and we can't get, you know, hunkering down, staying at home, being away from each other was the best alternative to a test that we can't get. Um, and so that's what we decided when we closed. Um, but then we started thinking about, okay, well, what about the people um, where unemployment isn't enough or you know, just people's livelihoods are also at stake. So it's a balance between, you know, your health and your lives, but you're also talking about your livelihood. And that's what we as restaurants provide for a lot of people, not just people who are interested in the restaurant industry. These are people who um, see restaurants as their um, lifeline, as they pursue their dreams of being an actor or a dancer, or all these you know, different um, different dreams that people have are is supported by working at the restaurants, um, and you know we also work with so many vendors and uh, purveyors, and their lives are lives and livelihoods are impacted too. And so we discussed, okay, well, let's try to get the machine back and running. But then exactly what you're talking about, how do you do that safely? And I think that's the biggest question. How do we reopen? So I kind of left it in my staff's hands to say to me, okay, I'm ready. Let's do this. How are we going to do this? And that's what I've been waiting and I'm starting to hear things like that. So, um, you know, luckily I had one staff member who came came back to help me. I don't know what I would have done if he didn't come because I was... <laughs> I was just, you know, just really suffering. I had so many sore muscles. And so, you know, right now it's a two person team, but now soon that's going to be a three, three person team. And I think that's how we do it step by step, person by person, safely as possible. Um, but that's what I'm thinking about delivery, our delivery heavy uh, locations like Korea. But places like Sakagura and Midtown. I don't think that we're going to really be able to open until November, December, towards the end of the year. It, it really is so unknown, um, just because people are gonna be nervous. Being in an enclosed space, sitting next to people that you don't know have this virus. So really, I think um, from, you know, the government has been saying, you know, testing and, testing is gonna be the way to come back. And I think that that's true. And that's why I don't think a lot of our concepts, if, if we weather the storm, if we can, that's the uncertainty too. Some of the reality is many of our restaurants are gonna be shuttered forever. Um, and I think that's a hard reality to be faced with. Um, and many, many people in New York and, 
in the world are facing that same heartbreak. That, that scares me to no end because as you know, Sakagura is my favorite restaurant in New York. It really Thank brings a part of Japan to the US. It happens to be close to Japan society, but you're hundred percent right. There's so much that we don't know. Uh, I guess as I'm listening to you, uh, I'm wondering, you know, as a second generation uh, Japanese American in New York, you've been through 9-11 in this city. Uh, you've seen 3-11 and what it did to Japan. Are there certain things about your background or your upbringing that kind of either A, have given you lessons as you think about this? I mean, what I love is I hear the American optimism in you of kind of, we're going to get through this, we're going to do this. And then I also hear the Japanese side of caution and being able to kind of do things in a traditional way. How do you think about your own background in terms of what that brings to the table and how you learn lessons as we go through this crisis that is so unknown? I think that's something that I think about every single day or I live through every single day. How do I balance um, this, like you said, an American side of me that's very forward and, you know, just um, I'm a go-getter and I raise my hand and all these things. And then the Japanese side, that's a little bit more reserved, hunker down. Both sides have its merits. Um, but I think this COVID-19 um, situation really kind of brought up that, that dichotomy to light um, again for me in the sense that um, my staff who are Japanese and my family out of love and concern for me um, said to me, Sakura, no, just stay calm. Don't, you know, don't push yourself too much, you know, maintain, uh, protect, you know, and it's just, um, they were just very concerned with me doing the hospital drops. But I think the American side of me is very much like, oh, I need to be out there. I need to put myself out there and do what I can. Um, and some people might say, but it's just a meal. You know, what? you're not really saving lives like doctors. And I think, you know, as a doctor, you take an oath to help your patients and things like that. And I was told I, I didn't take that oath. That's not my responsibility. Um, but I think it was a responsibility to myself. And I think it comes back to always kind of reevaluating re um, the two different sides of me and knowing myself. And that's how I came to the conclusion of doing this because um, at the end of the day, it's me who I have to deal with. And I knew that this was the right decision. And so, you know, maybe from my superiors, it seems a little bit um, sire or um, disrespectful to go against their wishes and especially because it's coming from a place of concern and for my well-being but um, I think they fully support me now and they understand that they might not agree but all they can do is to support me in my decision and in, in doing this so that's what they've been doing. So in our last minute, if you could give one piece of advice uh, to everyone, and then also uh, if we can help in any way, what would that be? Not just Japan society, but individuals around who, who look at New York and, and desperately love this city, but want to help, where would you direct them? Um, I think first and foremost, it's about, at the end of the day, um, people to people connections. Um, the people that have reached out to ask how I'm doing or how they can help. I think that's really the first step to care. Um, and so I don't necessarily, I mean, obviously I want to plug myself and say, you know, come, uh, please help us deliver these um, curries to healthcare workers and um, please donate to our cause so that we can do that. But I think it's more than that. I think it's just reach out to your friends, reach out to your friends, see what they're doing, reach out to your friends who are in New York. Cause I bet you they know, you know, um, how they think is the best way to help people in New York. And I think that's what makes New York great. As you started the conversation, we're strong, 
uh, New Yorkers and every single one of us is trying to get our beloved city up and running again. And we know people who are doing good and, you know, it's just about helping each other out. So I don't think it necessarily matters how you help. It's the thought of wanting to help and reaching out to the people that you love to find out how you can do so. Well, Sakura Yagi of TIC, thank you so much. I hope we get a chance to actually meet at one of your restaurants again. I'm so uh, really excited, well. uh, proud to know you, and also that you represent the very best of Japan, America, and also what it means to be a New Yorker, to come through this together. So uh, hopefully you can feel all of our positive vibes and energy as you're having to go through this. You're doing it on behalf of all of us. Let us know how else we can help. And thank you so much for doing what you're doing. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the opportunity.